This is Carl Spielvogel. This is my first podcast called Uncle Carl's Crazy Real Estate Stories because I do crazy deals, and most of them are very large deals, but there's always something uh, strange or weird, whether there's guns pointing at me, motorcycle gangs threatening my life, you know, just you know, chasing after dead people. It's uh, a lot, lot of crazy stuff goes on. But, you know, before I introduce myself, I want to just tell you about some of the deals we've completed and some of the ones we're working on. Uh, my first deal back started two years ago was fifty-eight thousand. The second deal was sixty-eight thousand. We had a couple of deals, forty, forty-two, forty-five, and uh, our best deal ever was two hundred forty-three thousand dollars in January. Uh, we also have some really big deals that'll be cashing out this year. We got one East Nineteenth Street will be about one hundred fifty thousand dollar profit. East 17th Street will be about $100,000 profit. We have on West Boulevard, it's probably be right under $150,000. Uh, Rush win, we could sell, make $80,000. One in Selden, $100,000. So we've got some really big deals, and I want to be able to share those with you uh, about, about the deals, how we do them, how we find them, and uh, the, the crazy stories that, that go along with it. Uh, we also have a, a, another deal that's going to cash out in August, three package deal of houses that will be will made will net about 225,000 on those three houses so but uh the kind of deals that we do we specialize in or, or do is we do we, a lot of our deals are wholesales or prehabs we'll take them buy them uh clean them up a little bit put them back on the market i think they call it hoteling now uh we do some flips some sub twos we do variances we deal with liens judgments we assemble properties. Uh, what else? We do land, subdividing land. And what we really specialize in is vacant houses, uh, missing heirs, foreclosures, pre-foreclosures. Uh, like I said, we'll do judgments if there's a title problem. And probably the thing we're best known for is, is searching people down and finding heirs to properties and putting that all together. That's probably probably what we're best known for. And want to go back in time when I first got into business. Uh, I was 21 years old. I was going to Appalachian State. I was working at the Subway store there. And the owner was a real estate agent. He lived in Hendersonville. And the manager was trying to buy the store from him, but was falling behind on the payments. And uh, put me in contact. I was working there with the owner. So we talked to the owner. And I said, hey, uh, you know, how much do you sell me the store for? He said, well, I'll sell it to you for 35000 all cash. So we're like, hey, this is great. You know, we're, we're, we're two students. We could turn this thing around. It was losing a little bit of money. So what we did is we went to all our relatives and said, hey, we got a great opportunity. Uh, we can buy the Subway store 35000 Will you loan us some money? And everyone's like, well, that's a great idea. Uh, we believe in you, but we're not going to give you any money. So we got a little bit depressed. Uh, a little upset and trying to figure out, you know, like, how can we do this? How can we do it? And then one day the manager just didn't show up and left. And the store was closed for probably three days. So I called the owner up in Hendersonville and said, hey, look, I want to buy the store. But uh, the manager's walked out. It's been closed for three days, but I only have $1,000. And the owner's like, get in there, open up the, I won't say, the words he said, but open up the store and I'll sell it to you for $1,000 down. And it was a week before exams. So I was like, hmm. I said, this is a great opportunity. So I quit school a week before exams and went in, opened up the store on a handshake deal. But we also had a problem. I didn't have $1,000. Uh, all I had was a, a raggedy old Volvo station wagon. So I ended up getting a partner. He put the thousand dollars in and I put the Volvo station wagon in as collateral and we went and opened up the store and worked out the deal with the owner. So we ended up buying the store for a thousand dollars down and he financed it to us. So I'd like to say we're some kind of like brilliant turnaround specialists. But what we did was we ended up calling the college paper and said, hey, um, we're two students. We just bought a subway. We do an article on us. So the the college newspaper did an article about hey two students buy a subway store 
and our sales went up like 300 to 500 dollars a day because you know the students supported us and you know we made some good changes too but that that was the real reason we were successful so there was there was some luck there uh and, and i think as i go through my stories you'll see there's quite a bit of luck and i think you make your own luck and you have to be willing to take an opportunity when you see it because how many people would have just dropped out on a handshake and, and gone in and opened the store. I mean, it was actually pretty stupid, but it worked out. So after I was there for a while, um, got restless. And we wanted to, I wanted to open another subway. So, uh, a friend of mine who had worked at the subway in Chapel Hill said, Hey, uh, here you own a subway store. I'd like to own a subway too. I said, well, it's easy. Just come up with $25,000, go ask your mom and I'll provide $25,000 for the equipment and we can be partners. And he went and asked his mom. She provided $25,000 worth of cash. And I leased the equipment. At the time, you could lease the equipment for $1,000. So I was partners in a subway store, another one, for $1,000. And that's how we expanded. And then the next store that we ended up buying, we ended up having like seven stores. And the reason I'm telling you these, these different stories is, is that you can be creative. And that's how I learned how, is, is putting things together creatively. So after, after that, there was another subway. Uh, it was just down the street, Hickory Grove Road. And the owner won $78,000. We're like, okay, we can give you $15,000 down. And he's like, no, no, I want cash. I want cash. And he was not a very good manager and uh, was having trouble with it. And he tried to sell it to other people and... At the time, uh, Subway wasn't as popular, and it just he wasn't able to sell it. So he called us back and said, hey, you guys uh, still interested in buying the store? I said, yeah, we'd, we'd really like to buy the store. And he said, okay, um, I'll take the $15,000 down and finance it to you. Well, we had a problem. We didn't have $15,000. We had about $5,000. So what we did was we took the $5,000 we had, and then we went, we had two other stores at the time. We didn't pay any of the bills. We didn't pay the rent. We didn't pay the food suppliers. And we ran the bills up, took the cash from that, and used that as the down payment. So we ended up putting the $15,000 down. But our food supplier cut us off, uh, had some people pretty upset with us because we didn't pay the bills at first. Um, and the landlords weren't real happy either. <laughs> because we didn't pay them but we also knew we could use the float because when you open up you don't pay your employees for about 10 days and you've got money coming in so we were able to use the float to pay back the other money so we basically as the money came in we took it from the sales to start paying back the bills and just you know fed the people a little bit of money i, I wouldn't recommend this probably not the smartest way to do business but that's how we opened that store uh because we just we didn't have the funds to do it, so we, we got creative. And what I would do after this, I would go sign leases to open another store, not knowing where the money was going to come from, not knowing how I was going to do it. I would just make a commitment on the store. So I would go find another location, sign lease, and then I was forced to figure it out. Uh, again, I probably wouldn't recommend this as a good business model, but it, 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 it worked. Um, and then... We also wanted to expand out into the Seattle market. So I flew out there, and the development agent drove me around to the different subway stores there. And he said, hey, this store here is a great location. It's um, in Bellevue, Washington, but it's just mismanaged. It's an absentee own owner. She really wants to sell it. So we basically, I went back in, talked to her, and we agreed on a price. And then I said, okay, you know, um, how much do you want down? She's like, well, no, we want the whole thing. I said, well, I'll pay you price, but I need to be able to put some money down and you finance it for me. And she was just so tired of it and just run down and just exhausted. She said, okay. So I think she agreed to sell it for like thirty five or 40000 down. I don't remember the exact numbers. So we were working on the paperwork, getting the paperwork done. And then I went back to her and I said, hey, look, I still want to pay you the full amount. But here's the situation. The store needs to be renovated. Uh, and, and I just can't buy it like this. I'm going to have to sink $20,000 into the store. And 
So I'm going to pay you everything. You're going to get your full amount, but I could only give you like $20,000 down. So I ended up negotiating down to give her less money. And we were, I think it was about 20,000. So uh, I was able to put $20,000 down and buy the subway. And actually that time I did have the full $20,000. So I didn't have to steal it from anywhere. So, but that's just an example of, of some of the creative ways that I did, did things. Um, the, another subway story was um, I was trying to open a, another store and of course I never have enough money to do it. So I would negotiate with the landlord for a higher rent if they would do most of the upfitting. So I opened one at McMullen Creek and one on Wendover in this is the Charlotte area. And uh, I think I was able to do it at the time for about 50,000 per store. Um, maybe a little bit less because I had the landlords um, do all the, the upfitting or mostly upfitting. So I was able to get in for really cheap. So I was always sort of had this knack for coming up with creative ways, how to do things, how to, uh, you know, how to do different deals um, like that. And then probably the, the best deals I did were the stores in Seattle. I ended up what, what worked well for me is I got two partners, um, Rosie and Nazim. Uh, Rosie was running a subway store, and she wanted to be an owner, and I wanted to move back to North Carolina. Uh, so what I did was I worked a deal for Rosie to take for one store and Nazim to take over one, the other store, and they got a small management salary, and I financed 40% of both stores for a dollar down. So they came in, they did a great job, ran them for a while. First, they loved me to death. And after a few years, they're like, hey, we're tired of doing all the work and you're making all the money. We want to buy you out. And I said, well, I don't want to be bought out. How about this? I give you 9% of both stores for a dollar. They're like, okay, we'll do that. So they did that for a while. A few more years went by and they're like, hey, we're doing all the work. We're tired of this. We want to buy you out. I said, well, how about this? I give you 11% of both these stores uh, for another dollar and I get to stay in it. And that worked out well because the stores are well, well run. They're very profitable and I receive money every month for doing, uh, nothing basically. So then what happened was, uh, I was getting a little bit tired of subway. There's a lot of problems with, with, in my opinion, with the franchisor putting stores too close together. And I didn't like the way they, they did some things. So it was time to make the exit and a buddy of mine, uh, called me up and said, hey, look, you need to get into real estate. There's this guy, Ron LeGrand. He's really good. He can teach us. He's uh, put, put on a course, and you can go to this course and learn how to do real estate. So we ended up, uh, I ended up going to that course, learning real estate. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. Uh, taught us a lot of creative stuff. Then another thing that we did, there's like a, a guy named Cameron Dunlap. had a great course on creative financing, 0% uh, financing, substitution collateral, subordination. So basically got immersed totally into the real estate. So I came back like, hey, I'm going to be a real estate investor. I'm going to be a real estate investor. And it took me about nine months to get my first deal. And uh, it, was, it was a pretty big struggle. Luckily, I still had my subways, um, some of the subways, and I was selling some of them out. And... So I got into real estate. I started doing a lot of creative deals, um, and I built it up pretty good. I was end up teaching uh, a buddy of mine, Mitch, and and Linda. We uh, did a course on how to do real estate and build up a pretty good uh, net worth. I was doing crazy deals, zero percent financing, subordination, ever moving seconds, you know, all sorts of of creative stuff, as well as you know, paying cash for stuff and and things like that. So we built it up and it was going pretty well. And then 2008 came along and I lost everything. Got down to zero dollars. Had to give back properties. Uh, luckily I worked really good with one of my uh, hard money lenders and he ended up coming out breaking even uh, with me. But um, I went from being this guy uh, teaching people how to do real estate to losing everything. It was pretty embarrassing. So after that, I hid out from real estate, hid, hid from real estate investors because I still owed, I still owed quite a few people money too. 
So I was hiding out and then I went into the car business with my ex-girlfriend. That was a huge mistake. So we did that for years. Um, we struggled, we borrowed more money, lost money, um, fought a lot. It was, it was just, it was, it was a nightmare. It was just tough. Uh, we were actually at one point, um, for about a year and a half, we moved into our car dealership and was sleeping in the back room. Uh, and we had three dogs. So we have three dogs back there. And at night, you know, we, we, they had a bed. Uh, it was actually an old house. So it wasn't that bad. It didn't have a kitchen, but you know, we, we had, uh, a bathroom and, you know, and then after everybody left, you know, we, we got our living room back. That's the only bad thing you know, during the day when the dealership was open, you know, I had all these people in my living room all day. So it wasn't real private, but you know, that's what we did to survive. We lived in our car dealership, um, uh, to survive and, uh, things weren't going well at all. And, uh, my ex-girlfriend and I got in a huge fight and, uh, she kicked me out. And, uh, I remember leaving. She, she kicked me out. I had $7 in my pocket. Uh, I didn't have a car, even though we had a car dealership. Um, all my clothes were in the car dealership. So I was walking down the street and I was crying. I called my mom. I said, mom, you got to come pick me up. Um, I can't, I won't say my ex-girlfriend's name, but, uh, anyway, she kicked me out. I have no place to go. Uh, you know, I have no money and she lived in Chapel Hill and I lived in Charlotte. She said, okay, I'll come get you, but I can't come get you till, uh, tomorrow. So I had to find a place to stay that night. And I was like, I don't want to go to the, sh the homeless shelter. That won't be real fun. So I called a friend of mine, uh, Penny. And I said, hey, Penny, uh, which I actually helped her get her house, which that turned out really good years ago. So she said, I said, I need a place to stay. Can you take me in? So she picked me up, uh, brought me to her house, hung out there that night. And then the next day, she drove partway to Chapel Hill, met with my mom, met me, and I dropped me off, and I went to Chapel Hill. Now, it's a really good thing. When I first got involved in real estate years ago, uh, a friend of mine, Penny, uh, she, oh, basically here's, here's what happened. Her kids were living with her aunt up, I think in Ohio, and she couldn't afford to bring them down. She was just barely making enough money to survive. And she was my roommate, friend of mine. So I said, Hey, uh, I have a way where we can get your kids back. She's like, how? I said, you're going to buy a house. She's like, how am I going to buy a house? I don't have any money. I said, you don't need money to buy a house. Um, so basically, I got her qualified for a program where she got $7,500 from the government for her down payment, and then she needed $750. Well, she didn't have any money, so I loaned her the $750. So she's able to buy the house basically for no money. And it was a three-bedroom house, one bathroom. But what we did was, uh, so we, she ended up getting her kids from Ohio, moved them in, and um, we all lived there for a while. So it's a good thing I helped her out years ago because she, she was able to come help me out that night and, um, uh, bring me in. So anyways, back to the, where I was on my mom's couch and I was like, well, you know, I'm 50 years old. Uh, I'm broke. Maybe I need to make a few changes in my life. So I started listening to Les Brown, uh, Brian Tracy, um, who else? Napoleon Hill. A lot of these people that, um, a lot of great, great guys. Les Brown was incredible because Les Brown is like, you can do it, get back up. You know, it was very um, inspirational. So I would listen to that. Then also listen to a lot of Napoleon Hill. And that sort of got the foundation that, hey, I, I can do this again. I can get back. You know, I was basically brainwashing myself. I listened all night, all day. And I was also on the phone saying, okay, what am I going to do? I need to figure out something. You know, I was trying to do everything from uh, sell insurance to, to whatever I could do to make money. You know, I was calling everybody, hey, do you know somebody that can help me out? I'm, uh, I'm really good at networking, da, 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 da. So I ended up um, moving back. My mom gave me like 1200 bucks. I moved back to Charlotte, and I started going to these different real estate meetings. Um, and I was trying to do a credit repair, all these different things. 
I was going to meeting to meetings and uh, ran into my one of my old business partners, Mitch. And we were talking, just hanging out. And he said, um, Carl, I got a, uh, a guy I can't find. His property's in foreclosure. If you can find him and get it under contract, I'll give you half the deal. I was like, oh, great. This, this is a great opening. So I was like, okay. I, I didn't know about skip tracing the time. I didn't know how to really do that part of the real estate. But what we ended up doing was um, I found the guy's resume online. And uh, at, at this time, my ex-girlfriend and I were still, I, was, I came back and helped out a little bit in the car dealership. So I said, hey, um, I called this guy up. I said, hey, I see that you are a used car turnaround specialist. He says, yeah, yes, I am. I said, well, I've got a car dealership that's, uh, that's failing. It's not doing well. It's uh, got some problems. And I'd like to hire you. So I hired this guy. He drove up from South Carolina, brought him to the dealership, said, hey, um, got to know him. And I said, hey, do you have any real estate in Charlotte? And he goes, no, no, I used to, but I don't have any real estate anymore. I'm like, okay, okay. But anyways, I, I got to know him, worked there a few days, did a good job. Then I let him go back to South Carolina. I also brought my partner Mitch in to meet him, introduce him. So once he went back to South Carolina, I called him up and said, hey, we just discovered you have a piece of property in Charlotte that's going into foreclosure. And uh, we'd be interested in buying it. And he said, well, I just got a phone call about the about that. And someone else wants to buy it for $35,000. I'm like, oh, crap. What do we do? So I said, hey, uh, when do you have your lunch? He said, well, my lunch is in about an hour and a half. I said, well, Mitch and I are going to come down. Let's talk. So we drove down there, talked to the, the gentleman and said, hey, you know, you know us. You, you know, this is someone just calling you the phone. You know, we'll, we'll go and pay you, I think, $36,000 for your property. He's like, yeah, I know you guys. Da, 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 so I'll, I'll sell you the, the, the property. So he ended up selling us the property for $35,000. And what we did, that was just a lot, actually, that, that had a foreclosure issue. So Mitch bought it, took care of the, the issue, and then we ended up having an offer for, I think, about $90,000 for it. And I remember because I was out eating pizza with Mitch and drinking beer, and I was like, I literally got up and I was dancing. I was so happy. We're, I'm going to make a lot of money, get $90,000 for it. And Mitch says, hold on, let's wait. Uh, I think we can get more. And I'm like, but, but, but we have an offer for 90000 He says, we can get 115 for this property. I'm like, okay, you paid for it. I want the money now. I'll trust you. So we got an uh, agent um, named was Shannon, and uh, she went around, did a great job, went around to the different real estate meetings and got us an offer at 115 So after everything was said and done, we made the paying commissions and holding costs, everything. We made $58,000 on that one deal. I was pretty excited. And, and Mitch was pretty excited too. He's like, okay, well, that, that's great. I got another one for you. I got another one where it's a little more complicated. Like, okay, let, let's, let's go do this. It was, uh, what happened was it was uh, another foreclosure type issue going on with the property. And he said, here's the problem is the, um, the person has passed away who owned it and they've got some heirs and you're gonna have to figure out, you know, the heirs and you're going to have to figure out you know, how to get it all done. So I just jumped in and said, okay, we're, we'll figure this out. So what we did was um, I've been going to real estate meetings and I heard about this thing called bin verified. It's basically a skip trace program. So I was able to figure out, you know, from the uh, estate file who one of the heirs was. And they lived in Charlotte. So I basically got on the, this been verified, went through, and you can get on people's Facebook pages. So I went to her Facebook page. I wanted to find out as much as I could about her before I went and talked to her. So I was scrolling down the Facebook page, and she has these pan pictures of her and the Carolina Panthers. So I was like, okay, she's, she's a big Carolina Panther fan. She really likes the Panthers. So I went and knocked on the door. But actually before that, I left notes i've sent fedex packages saying hey i can help you i can help you with this 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 problem um even though i didn't really know how what i was doing and i was just going to figure out along the way so we ended up 
uh, at, she didn't call back. So I went and knocked on her door one day and she answered. But what I did was I had been to Super Bowl uh, the year before. So I took the um, my Super Bowl hat, my Super Bowl jacket, uh, Panther Super Bowl. So when I went there, knocked on our door, I was all dressed up in this Panther stuff. So we were just sitting there talking. I said, hey, you know, I'm interested in your property. Would you be interested in selling it? We can help you out. You know, I know that there's some issues and stuff. And she goes, did you go to the Super Bowl? I said, oh, yes, it's a great story. So we were able to sit there and bond and and uh, talk. But it, it ended up that what happened is she had, uh, her father passed away, and then the property went to her, and it also went, she had a half-sister. So we had to make a deal with her and the half-sister. But we ended up buying that property, and then we took it, and then we resold it. Um, and there's also some title issues we had to straighten out um, because the state wasn't open. We took that property and resold it and uh, made $68,000 on that. And that's when we sort of figured out that um, there's a lot of money in these foreclosures where somebody's passed away, where there's some kind of problem. If we can solve the problem, solve the estate issues, we can make a lot of money. And, and for this last property, she was going to lose the property because the house was in foreclosure. Um, there's still a loan on it. So if we didn't get something done, she wouldn't have got anything. So it's, it's like creating a win-win situation for, for everybody. Okay, Uncle Carl's going to wrap it up here, but stay tuned next week. We're going to talk about the mindset and go into depth about some of the big deals, the $243,000 deal and some of the other large deals that we did and show you what you need to do to get these deals done, how to find them, and creating the right mindset. So please join me next week, and I appreciate you listening.